Hey guys, so let's see here, I'm back. And I wanted to build more on the prehistory, if you like, of existentialism. As we discussed, existentialism broadly is a movement from the late 19th, mid to the late 19th through early 20th, early to mid 20th centuries with uh, its sort of real uh, uh, acme being achieved in the latter segment of that trajectory with thinkers like Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, in a certain qualified way, Martin Heidegger, Merleau Ponty, Albert Camus, uh, and so on. And what we have discussed is sort of the, 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 the ethical moments which constitute existentialism, the considerations of freedom as exercised against an awareness of our own finitude. And that dimension, or those facets of existentialism, obviously extend beyond existentialism itself. But what distinguishes it, especially in the 20th century, is the manner in which it's informed by another intellectual current less well-known, phenomenology. And it is so informed by phenomenology that I feel it is incumbent upon us to give some words of definition around that. Phenomenology as a word um, goes back to the middle 18th century and is used hither and thither uh, by numerous thinkers, more or less to describe the uh, science of lived experience, if you like. And there's a very physicalist feel to it. So, for instance, Immanuel Kant talks about it in relation to questions of optics and not just optics, uh, the influence of motion and relative perspective and how we... Uh, come to interact with what we know as the the physical domain. He was hardly the only one to do so, but uh, it seems relatively uh, paradigmatic. The major exception to that being uh, Hegel, who uh, in his uh, he wrote a book, um, the Phenomenology of Spirit, which was not one of his more celebrated works until phenomenology came into its own about, you know, in the middle uh, 20th century, right? So the word is there, but it's just around. It's not used, it certainly isn't considered uh, coeval with the movement until uh, a guy by the name of Franz Brentano, who starts to bring it back into circulation. Brentano was interested in responding to certain trajectories of what we know as psychology by bringing to bear the notion of intentionality, the intentionality of consciousness, by which one means here the way in which all our conscious acts have an aboutness to them. All mental life has this directed quality. You don't simply see, you see something. You don't simply hear, you hear something. You don't simply think, you think something. And so on and so forth. So this notion of intentionality doesn't originate with Brentano. In fact, it receives some discussion in Aristotle, and is invoked also by people like Thomas Aquinas. And those were thinkers who very much influenced Brentano. He brought and wanted to make the intentional quality of consciousness central to the project of psychology. One of his students, Edmund Husserl, though, is the true father of phenomenology because he took this important germinal 
renovation suggested Brontano, by Brontano and radicalized it to say this is significant not just for psychology but for all sciences really for the project of philosophy itself and it's not just a manner of not just a matter of illuminating the significance of the intentional quality of consciousness but going from there to fill out the structure of experience itself to core or altogether emphasizing that experience itself is really where the goods to, are to be found we need to resist the temptation to lose ourselves in the abstractions even of the natural sciences and mathematics lest we become deluded in holding the objectivism that they have provided as promissory as the end of the road. While that objectivism or that objectivity has great power, it is still ultimately derivative is still ultimately at a remove from the actual space of human life itself. And with what are we concerned most principally is not an abstraction, not a remove, not an explanation, but with life itself. For Husserl, this is most, more or less framed in terms of the questions of description. For his followers, it becomes more than a task of description. For instance, Heidegger, and not only Heidegger, but Heidegger is probably most famous for this criticism. And, and Heidegger is a very problematic thinker, but unfortunately, not least because of his associations with uh, Nazis and his sort of rank careerism and whatnot. So there's lots of ugliness about Martin Heidegger, but uh, that ugliness does not justify us dismissing the fact that he was an, a, 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 an important figure in the history of 20th century thought, uh, lamentably so. But uh, not to get thrown off on that tangent, to come back to his concern with Husserl, his concern with Husserl was that mere description overlooks the circumstance that every description is itself a form of interpretation. That we cannot ultimately escape the circumstance. That we are thrown into the world. That we are embedded as factual, as historical entities. And that this facticity, this historicity, colors everything that we encounter. And... Uh, we can maybe in small relief undertake certain abstractions, certain bracketings to go back to what uh, Husserl was talking about, bracketing the degree to which we are influenced by these historical, cultural, social inheritances so that we may encounter experience in its rawest and purest form but these bracketings themselves uh, can never be purely naive. Uh, we can't be naive about that. Now what Husserl further says here, which leads me to believe that the difference between Heidegger and Husserl is more a difference of emphasis than than substance, is that uh, we also must understand that the structure of the conscious act, that its aboutness itself is instructive as to the nature of being, that it has, to use a fancy pants philosophical word, an ontological significance. So we come to the question of those 
existence, those objects, if you like, that we encounter in our everyday life, right? You know, pens, pencils, traffic lights, trees. Uh, but they don't actually really ever present themselves purely as objects. There's a paradox because when we interrogate our experience or, you know, I've come to, this is what Husserl, I would say, suggests. And I would say it maps with my own personal experience because it's just fundamental that you do this work yourself, right? You just, you just don't take it from the book. Otherwise, the whole spirit of the phenomenological project is vacated from the outset. But the suggestion is that, you know, so you come across a tree, what do you encounter? Now, if you're trying to be clever, you're like, well, this is a ball game back to raw experience. We don't want to be too interpretive. Okay, so I see colors and shapes and what have you, but that's actually not quite true. That itself is subtly uh, being hypnotized by those vestiges of a cultural inheritance. Because our raw experience is not of a shape, right? Um, not of colors or textures abstracted. It is of a wholeness. The, the tree presents itself with a kind of thematic singularity. And then subsequently we might look at a portion of that tree and focus on that. But even that portion then itself in turn has a kind of wholeness and so on and so forth. So this changes the complexion of the story of natural science where the tree is composed of cells which in turn are composed of organelles and so on down the chain to the subatomic and the sub subatomic levels, right? Where we could just try and take it all apart. But we never actually encounter that apartness. What we encounter is a being that has a fundamental integrity. And moreover, in the space of that encounter, two other moments are conspicuous. The context of that tree, which is the world, but that world is not merely the tree's world. It is our world. And we are the other moment, the moment of subjectivity and we might be well advised ultimately to leave these words subjectivity and objectivity behind because they can obscure the manner in which all these moments are inextricably linked so what does this have to do with existentialism well with what it has to do with existentialism is that it revivifies the significance of lived experience, which is the space wherein the challenges, the questions, the issues of freedom, finitude, awareness, and responsibility ultimately themselves become energized and significant. Those issues are not significant if we are merely a collection of chemicals. And this movement that insists that a human being is more than the outcome of so many material processes is very close to the heart of existentialism and draws great inspiration from the phenomenological currents that I have attempted in a very cursory fashion here to summarize. Uh, all of these currents, I think, are a very healthy counterpoint to the naturalistic tendencies which dominated and which continue to uh, hold a certain sway, a certain hegemony to hazard a political uh, politically colored word. Uh, it, the currents of phenomenology and existentialism are a very healthy, welcome counterpoint to the tendencies of naturalism and reductionism, which are dominant in the discourses, the conversations of thought in our day. So, there you have it. 
uh, what is phenomenology, what is its significance to existentialism. If you have any questions, please sort of put them in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to them. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Talk soon.